Anyway, good evening. How are we doing? Fantastic. Let me pray and we're going to get stuck into this very odd passage. Father, thank you for your presence here tonight. It is amazing to worship you in spirit and in truth. And Father, there is truth packed into this passage tonight. And we pray that you will help us by your spirit to unpack it together. We might love you more and trust you more. In Jesus' name, amen. So we are in uh, week two of this series, Jesus on Every Page. And if you remember last week, we, uh, we just began with that honest assessment that the Old Testament is difficult to understand for a number of different reasons. Uh, and some of them might resonate more than others with you. It may be that you struggle with the primitive superstitions that you might find in a book like Numbers, uh, where you see the test for the unfaithful wife. Drink some dirty water. If you feel sick, you're probably uh, faithful. If you don't feel sick, you're probably unfaithful. Strange. Or maybe for you, it's the theological kind of conundrums. How do you read Genesis 1 to 3? Was it literal? Uh, do we, is it six days? Is it a young earth? Is it a flat earth? What do we do with that? Or perhaps for you, it's reading some of the history, and it's, it's pretty bloody. And you think, God seems here to command genocide. The Israelites are told to destroy the men, the women, and the children, and the animals, everything. What do I do with that? Or perhaps for you, it's just some of the very odd cultic rituals. Maybe it's the, the kind of detailed descriptions of uh, the sacrifices in a, the book of Leviticus, which just goes on and on about the long lobe of the liver. Uh, or perhaps it's a ritual like this one, where you just can't quite imagine what it must be like to hack your way down the middle of several animals and then to lay them on their sides. And so we neglect the Old Testament, don't we? Because it's quite hard work. But Jesus says that the Old Testament is all about him. When he engaged with the theologians and the Bible teachers of his day, who just loved finding little bits and pieces throughout the Old Testament, he said to them, if you really understood it, you would realize that it's all about me. And you wouldn't reject me like you are, you would come to me instead. There's that wonderful story at the end of Luke's gospel where the risen Jesus comes alongside two disciples. They don't know he's risen. As far as they're concerned, he's just been killed and all their hopes have been dashed. And he walks with them and, and explains to them, beginning with Moses, so beginning with Genesis and working right the way through to the prophets, the end of the Old Testament, everything concerning himself. And they begin to understand that the Messiah had to suffer and die and then be raised to life again. And right at the end, after they'd realized who it was, they looked at each other after he'd gone and, and said to themselves, didn't our hearts burn within us as he opened the scriptures to us? That's what our hope is for this series, that your hearts, our hearts, burn within us as we encounter Jesus. Because it's in the Bible that we encounter Jesus. We don't just learn about him, though we do learn about him. We meet him in its pages. And this year, we're going to be uh, kind of focusing our attention, I suppose, on encounter. Going deeper into God. Meeting with him personally. And so we thought it was right to start with the Bible. And so we've got this series, Jesus on Every Page. Last week we looked at Christ's planet and we explored together how you can see Jesus in the creation story. Next week, Darren's going to be looking at Christ's past. That You can see Jesus in the actual history, the events that happened in the life of the people of God, of Israel. And then in the final week, the fourth week, we're going to look at Christ's precepts, how you can even see Jesus in the law, the Torah, the commandments. And the reason that we argue all of that is because we believe that Jesus is God's language, that God himself, when he communicates, he communicates through his son, and we find his son in the Bible. So this week, what we're going to look at is Christ's promises, Jesus in the covenant, the promise of God. And we're going to look at two things. We're going to look at Abraham, that he was loyal to God and right with God. 
So let's start with that first idea, loyal to God. A little bit of background. Uh, Abraham was married to Sarah. Uh, They were childless. And in this culture, that was terrible. It was a real stigma. It was a living death. But God had promised Sarah that she would conceive and bear a child, but she hadn't yet. So she was in this terrible kind of in-between place where there was a kind of, on the one hand, a desire to see God honor that promise, a sense of hope and expectation. There was genuine possibility there. But then on the other hand, there was ongoing disappointment and frustration. And so she feels this absence And there is a real aching and longing in her heart. And yet, in our passage, God speaks to Abraham and asks even more of him. In that place of pain, sterility isn't enough. Verse 1, go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, he says. Sorry, it's in chapter 12, verse 1. And so what God asks of of Abraham and Sarah is that they they kind of leave behind their security, their identity. They just need to abandon it, let it go. They need to uh, let go of that sense of of kind of geography, where they belong, the, the places that they were familiar with. They need to let go of their traditions and their rituals and, and, and and the customs of their people, their ethnicity. And they need to let go those family relationships that provided them with sustenance, even inheritance. They had to let go of all of those things for a promise that God hadn't delivered on. He had promised them children and they were still childless. And yet, incredibly, Abraham goes and he's 75 years old. And what he goes into is something extraordinary because he's not being sent off somewhere. He doesn't have a clear mission, a purpose. He just has to go. And so it's directionless. He's wandering. He's roaming. And in that sense, it's still without purpose or meaning. And yet, in the midst of that confusion, he remains loyal. He's obedient. He does as he is told. And so we get to chapter 15, and it's, it's the key chapter in the book of Genesis. Perhaps the key chapter in the Old Testament. And it is baffling, isn't it? There's clearly confrontation between Abraham and God. It's fraught with tension. Abraham is angry. God has given him this vision and called him to trust it, to be this new kind of human being, but he is not honoring his side of the bargain. And so uh, Abraham protests, and there's this kind of sharp exchange between the two of them. Abraham refutes the promise. Where's the result? Come on, show me. What are you actually doing? And he resists the reassurance that God offers him and says, look, I'm not going to be fobbed off by your easy words. Verse 3, I, you have given me no children, so a servant in my household will be my heir. He is angry. You can feel it, can't you? And what does God do? He takes him outside and he shows him the stars. There's no persuasion. There's no apology. He doesn't offer any excuses, but he doesn't offer any guarantees either. He simply reasserts the promise. That's it. More words. And if you notice, what's extraordinary is nothing changes in his circumstances, yet somehow still Abraham believes. There's no kind of surge in his loins. He's not romanced by these beautiful stars. He believes. You see, Abraham's faith is not kind of some pious unthinking acceptance or a kind of abdication of reason, his faith is it's hard fought, it's resisted and questioned, it's full of risk, it's not certainty. That he has this kind of primal awareness that God is God, and if he says something, that is enough. And so God makes a promise, Abraham trusts him. He's loyal to him. He pledges his allegiance to him. He says, I will be faithful to you. 
Abraham is loyal to God. But he's also right with God, because we have here in this passage this revolutionary moment. It is a a watershed, a landmark moment in the whole Old Testament. Verse 6, Abraham believed the Lord, and he credited it to him as righteousness. And that verse influences all of uh, the reflections upon Jesus in the New Testament. Who was he? Why did he die? How should we understand him? All flows back to this verse, verse 6, where God kind of designates or reckons Abraham to be right with him, to be in the right, to be pleasing to him. Theologians will talk about being justified or rectified. Simply means we're right. Things are good between the two of us. And you notice the basis of that is not circumcision, it's not a particular ritual, that comes later. Neither is it a certain set of rules, the Ten Commandments, they come later as well. It is based on one thing and one thing alone, and that is Abraham's faith. He trusts God. He pledges his allegiance to God. He says, I will be faithful to you, and it is that that makes Abraham right with God. Now, we're doing this series, Jesus on Every Page. So where is Jesus in this story? Is he really on this page? Well, I think he is. You see, Abraham is not just an example to Christians of of a faithful man. Abraham's faithfulness, says the New Testament, actually anticipates and is fulfilled in Jesus' faithfulness. Abraham is the faithful Israelite that God makes a covenant with. Jesus is the faithful Israelite who God makes a covenant with. So we see that in Jesus' faithfulness. He is the one that comes from heaven to earth, the far country. He's sent from God as Abraham was sent. He lives a life of obedience. He is faithful as Abraham was faithful. So Abraham is a symbol of a signpost to Jesus. So when you read Abraham, think Jesus. Just go and read the book of Galatians, and you'll see Abraham popping up again and again and again. Because for Paul, the apostle who wrote Galatians, Jesus is on every page. Look at uh, chapter 2, verse 16 of Galatians. Paul says this, A person is not justified by observing the law, but through the faithfulness of Jesus Christ. He'd just been talking about the faithfulness of Abraham. So we too have put our faith in Christ Jesus that we may be justified on the basis of the faithfulness of Christ and not by observing the law. So Jesus' faithfulness makes us right with God. How is that possible? How does he do that? What is it that holds Abraham's faith and Jesus' faith together, what do they have in common? Covenant. That's the big idea that we need to grasp together tonight. Now, this is the the big picture. This is the architecture of Scripture that holds the whole Bible together. So what we're going to look at now is quite complex, it's quite a challenging thing to get your head around, but if you get this idea of covenant, you get it, scripture as a whole. Big claim? Are we up for that? Good, here we go. (laughs) So covenant, what is it? It is the promise that God makes to Abraham, it's God's commitment to humanity as a whole. It's how God relates to us, and it's right here in our passage. Look at verse 17. When the sun had set and darkness had fallen, a smoking fire pot with a blazing torch appeared and passed between the pieces. Would you believe that that is the key to unlocking the Bible? It's pretty shocking. It's a provocative kind of imagery. You can see it here. It's a bit like this Damien Hirst picture of the cow. You can walk between the two pieces. What it is, it's an ancient depiction of covenant ratification, a bit like signing the marriage register at a wedding. 
There are two types of um, covenant in the ancient Near East. You need to go back a few thousand years in your mind. There is a treaty, which is a covenant between uh, two nations with conditions. You can imagine a small nation appealing to a powerful empire and saying, we are being threatened by these, these other nations. Please come and help us. And so the king comes and says, I will help you if you do this for me, if you give me this tribute, if you allow me to station my troops in your land, if you trade with me on these favorable terms, whatever it might be. And the king and his vassal, as he now is, would come together and they would sign a treaty and they would chop two animals in half and walk through them together. And they would say, if I break my side of this treaty, then may it be to me like it has become to these animals. You can kill me if I break my side of the treaty. Okay, And you can see that. That's in the Bible. Um, Jeremiah says that uh, this was a bit like it, like, like it was for the people of Israel. Jeremiah 34, those who have violated my covenant and have not fulfilled the terms of the covenant they made before me, I will treat like the calf they cut in two and then walk between its pieces. The leaders of Judah and Jerusalem, the court officials, the priests, and all the people of the land who walk between the pieces of the calf, I will deliver into the hands of their enemies who seek their lives. Their dead bodies will become food for the birds and the wild animals. That's a treaty. It has conditions. If you broke it, you were in trouble. You were going to be like one of those animals. But there was another kind of covenant. It was the grant. Now, a grant was made without conditions. So it was a promise. It was a gift from the king to someone he loved. There were no expectations, no stipulations, and no sanctions. The person who received the grant didn't need to do anything at all. That was very rare. But God gave grants too. So what you see in the Old Testament, you see God's covenant with creation, with Adam, is a treaty. There is a condition, and they break that condition because they eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And so creation is fractured and broken and torn apart. Something has gone wrong. And yet God promises to renew the world to bless the nations, to make things right again. And he does that through this covenant with Abraham. It's not a treaty, it's a grant. Who walks through the pieces? Or what moves through the pieces in our text? It's a smoking brazier, isn't it? It's kind of hard to imagine in your mind. But that's a symbol of God. Does Abraham walk through the pieces? No, because there are no conditions for him to fulfill. God says, I will do this. And if I don't, may it be to me as, if these, as these animals. You can kill me if I don't keep my side of the bargain. And no ancient Near Eastern king has ever done that. And he promises with as much certainty as he can give to Abraham, that one day his offspring, singular, Paul points out, he will do this. He will renew the covenant. And how is God going to do that? You see, the great challenge, and here's the complexity, in order to uh, fulfill the grant... The treaty needs to be restored because it's been broken. So God has promised to make things right, but in order to make things right, he's got to repair what has been broken. And so the whole history of the people of Israel is designed to repair that treaty that's been broken. So God enters into a covenant, a conditional one, a treaty with the people of Israel, but they can't keep it either. And so they break it, and there are sanctions upon them, and they're thrust into exile. How is God going to fulfill this grant if no one can keep this treaty? Well, it's Jesus. He is the faithful Israelite that keeps the treaty on behalf, not just of Israel, 
but humanity as a whole. He leads an obedient life. He takes on himself the curse, the sanctions of that treaty that was broken by Israel, by humanity. He takes those curses on himself. And in doing that, releases blessing to all of us. It is Jesus himself who walks through the pieces and is executed on the cross. And it is Jesus who fulfills the grant, the promise that God made to Abraham when he showed him the stars in the sky. It is Jesus who is the climax of the covenant. You see, Jesus is on every page. So what do we do with all of that? There's so much there. If you get that, you get the whole Bible. So it's like, this is the tough bit. (laughs) The rest gets easier. What we see is here is Christ's promises. Jesus is on every page. He's the new Abraham, the faithful Israelite who is loyal to God. And he institutes the new covenant. It's fulfilled in him so that all of us can be right with God. And the result of that is this extraordinary thing, this new humanity that's not defined by geography or ethnicity or family, but by faith, trust alone. It's that that brings us into relationship with God and that means all of us can enjoy it. It's universal, it's inclusive. No one is left on the outside. And you know what's wonderful about this story is it says to us, do you know, you can be honest with God. Faith isn't kind of unthinking, passive acceptance. It's loyalty, it's allegiance when life is difficult. It is something that is contested and fought over. Faith includes doubts and questions and rage. It's a call to be real. And if you read the Psalms, you can see just that. And the good news is, is we don't need to be afraid of being honest with God. Because our relationship with God doesn't depend on our faith, it depends on the faithfulness of another. And so we have no need to impress God. We have no need to to try and make the grade. We don't have to walk through the pieces. God walked through the pieces. Jesus walked through the pieces when he was nailed to the cross. See, Jesus is on this page. And that gives us a real sense of assurance that what needs to be done to make us right with God has been done. And we can relax. It can give us confidence that because we are right with God, we can come into his presence and enjoy a relationship with him. It gives us a deep sense of gratitude that he has done it for us on our behalf. And most of all, it drives us to our knees in worship because it is an amazing love don't you think that's done all this so that we can know him